and now live to the U.S. House floor. House will be in order, and the chair lays before the House a communication from the Speaker. The Speaker's Room is Washington, D.C., June 18, 2012. I hereby appoint the Honorable Stephen C. LaTourette to act as Speaker Pro Temporary on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Prayer today will be offered by our Chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. We ask your special blessing upon the members of this people's house. They face difficult decisions in difficult times with many forces and interests demanding their attention. In these days, give wisdom to all the members that they might execute their responsibilities to the benefit of all Americans. Bless them, O oh God, and be with them and with us all this day and every day to come. And may all that is done be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Chairs examine the journal of the last day's proceeding and announces to the House's approval thereof, pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Please join me in the Pledge of our flag and our country. The chair will entertain a uh, request for one minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? The speaker asks permission to rise, address the House for, we ask unanimous consent to rise, address the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, on Friday, the administration showed it is less concerned with supporting policies that will put millions of unemployed Americans back to work and instead has decided to go in an entirely new direction. Unilateral changes in law that have been done for political expediency put <coughs> individuals ahead of the 12 and a half million people who've been seeking work for the past three and a half years. Mr. Speaker, the administration has produced an executive order that is a political decision, purely political, and one that will continue to block opportunities for American citizens trying to find employment. Prosecutorial discretion is what we were heard this was. This is not prosecutorial discretion. Prosecutorial discretion means you decide whether or not to prosecute an individual for a crime they may or may not have committed. What this is, is new policy. New policy that is being implemented by the administration unilaterally. No respect for the People's House. No respect for the United States Congress. No respect for the legislative branch. And instead, prosecutorial discretion now has morphed into, well, we'll provide you a work permit good for two years that's renewable for two years. This administration has a history of picking winners and losers. This time it's got to stop. This Congress needs to stand up to this administration starting today. I yield back. This time's expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the notion that I can suspend deportations through executive order, that's just not the case, because there are laws on the books that Congress has passed. Mr. Speaker, that was President Obama a year ago, but that was then and this is now. And on Friday, the administration issued an imperial decree acting to unilaterally ignore portions of the immigration law of the land. Mr. Speaker, the last time I checked, it was Congress who makes law, not the President. And it is the job of the executive to enforce laws, not ignore the ones he just doesn't like. The president has no interest in fixing the broken immigration system. Instead, he has decreed this temporary amnesty in hopes of winning votes in November. He doesn't like the constitutional process for lawmaking because it just gets in his way. So he acts like an emperor instead of a president. 
It's time for the constitutional professor, the former constitutional professor, to read the Constitution. And that's just the way it is. What purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask the address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, in Wednesday's Washington Examiner, columnist John Stossel quoted economist John B. Taylor of the Hoover Institution who stated, quote, unpredictable economic policy, massive fiscal stimulus, and ballooning debt, the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing with multi-year near-zero interest rates, and regulatory uncertainty due to Obamacare and the Dodd-Frank financial reforms is the main cause of persistent high unemployment and our feeble recovery, end of quote. Over the last three years, our economy has not improved. Our unemployment rate has remained above 8 percent. Our small business owners have been faced, forced to pay higher taxes, and the government spending continues to spiral out of control. The President and his liberal allies in the Senate continue to support legislation that creates more barriers, resulting in job loss. The President and the Senate should work with House Republicans and pass over 30 House bills that are aimed to create jobs through private sector growth. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. Best wishes for speedy recovery for Earl Brown of Columbia. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I want to praise my colleague from Pennsylvania, Senator Toomey, for introducing an amendment to the Farm Bill to phase out the federal sugar program. Though the Senate narrowly voted to table the amendment, it demonstrated their substantial bipartisan support to reform a program that hurts American job creators and consumers. Today's Wall Street Journal editorial entitled A Tale of Two Conservatives also praises Senator Toomey, calls out the Republicans who voted against this free market amendment. By some estimates, the federal sugar program artificially doubles the price of sugar in the United States. While we protect sugar growers and processors, sugar users and consumers are at a severe disadvantage, and American jobs have been lost as foreign competitors benefit from reduced prices for raw sugar. The Department of Commerce estimates that sugar-using industries lost 112,000 jobs from 97 to 2009. Here in the House, I'm working with Danny Davis on a bipartisan amendment to the Farm Bill, and I hope that when the Chamber considers reform in the Farm Bill, Democrats and Republicans can come together to protect jobs and stop the government from playing favorites. I'll you back. What purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, last week Barack Obama unilaterally and unlawfully changed America's immigration law by ordering the federal government to accept illegal aliens' applications for work permits. I am deeply alarmed that America's president so blatantly undermines the rule of law. Article 1, Section 1 of our Constitution states, quote, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. Article 1, Section 8 states, quote, The Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce and to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Article 2 defines executive branch power. It does not give any president the power to make his own laws. In America, we elect presidents, not Caesars. The only way to change America's immigration law is as our Constitution demands, through Congress, not by imperial decree. In America, no one, not even the president, is above the law. I urge Congress and all law-abiding Americans to protect our Constitution from White House attacks. Chair would remind all members to avoid uh, personal references or personalization of actions by the President of the United States. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the more than 1,500 youth from across America visiting our nation's capital this week to participate in the 48th annual Electric Cooperative Youth Tour. These high school juniors and seniors are attending meetings with their senators and representatives, watching floor action from the respective galleries and visiting museums and memorials dedicated to our country's rich past. I personally look forward to meeting with the 18 participating students from Nebraska and urge my colleagues to take time this week to meet with youth from their states as well. These students are part of a great tradition. 
Every June for the past 48 years, more than 50,000 young citizens and future leaders have come to Washington, D.C. with the help of their electric cooperatives. Electric cooperative youth tour alumni are now engaged at many levels of government as well. I want to once again applaud these young people and thank participating electric cooperatives and rural electric associations for sponsoring this program to instill lessons of citizenship in the next genera generation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nevada rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the outstanding career of Dr. John W. Becker, or Chief, as he was called by scores of medical residents, an osteopathic physician who has dedicated his life to his patients, his students, and to the improvement of the medical profession. Dr. Becker's commitment to the field of emergency medicine spans more than 30 years. As professor and chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, he has helped countless students and residents, myself included, develop their skills and become an essential part of our healthcare workforce. As a young resident at Albert Einstein Medical Center, I was fortunate to have Dr. Becker's insight and guidance as my residency director. His dedication to emergency medicine was evident then, and his understanding of the osteopathic profession was invaluable to my training and to my career. His involvement in the field of osteopathic medicine is unparalleled. In addition to his work at PCOM, he currently serves as the Secretary Treasurer of the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners and is a, board, is a member of the Board of Trustees for the American Osteopathic Association. He was a member of the editorial board of the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association for nearly 20 years, and he is the past president of the American College of Osteopathic Emergency Physicians, and these are only some of his accomplishments. His never-ending contributions and service to his profession and his patients have rightly been recognized, most recently by the awarding of the O.J. Snyder Memorial Medal. Dr. Becker's lifelong commitment to patient care and to the excellence of future physicians serves as a powerful legacy to the field of emergency medicine. I consider myself fortunate to have learned under his leadership, and it is an honor to recognize his achievements. Chief, my sincere congratulations on your well-deserved retirement, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair lays before the House communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir. Pursuant to the permission granted in Clause 2H of Rule 2 of the Rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, the Clerk received the following message from the Secretary of the Senate on June 15, 2012, at 10.20 a.m. that the Senate passed without amendment House Concurrent Resolution 128. With best wishes, I am signed sincerely, Karen L. Haas. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess 